and we're good to go. Hello everybody, John Grimsmo here, bringing you another quarantine vlog. I think number seven. It's getting a little squirrely up in here. Um, okay, today I made my final changes to what I need to do to the part. So I'm gonna load up the code and then make another part. And I, I'm really happy with this. What I did actually yesterday, I didn't film it. I assembled, see the brass in there? I assembled one in my pen and uh, tested it out. Everything's great. Um, works awesome, except there's a little tiny bit of bounce. Let's see if you can hear it. A little ever so slight focus. So I'm, I, they've always had this, and on the Nakamura when we were making the parts over there, um, we would just compensate the tool and like move the tool over a little bit and fake it and make it good. And what's doing that is the position of the three holes. So we would move them down a little bit manually, but on the Nak we had one tool doing it, on here we have four tools doing it. So it was a lot more complicated to move it down. But I moved it down by a few thou and I, I finally, this has been bugging me for a long time, but I finally dug deep into the, the design of it and figured out why the bounce is there, even though the parts are made to spec. And it's, it's tolerance stack up. That's exactly what it is. It's, you got multiple surfaces that have a clearance and then another clearance and then another clearance and then another clearance and then a ball in a sliding hole and the hole is bigger than the ball. And when you, when it's like this, when it's down, everything is compressed and there's still some wiggle room everywhere. So I have to manually, and I was able to figure this out in Fusion, uh, figure out basically the exact movement in order to get what I think will be zero, zero squish. You don't want to go too far, otherwise you're going to have a mechanism that fails and is not secure. So it's a balance. Tiny, tiny bit of squish is okay. Um, too much is bad and too much other way is bad too. So. Good news. So yesterday, pick up a random part out of the bread. Um, I was complaining about, not yesterday, day before. I was complaining about how the threads look a little chunky on the inside, especially under the microscope. Like, like there's a mismatch between the thread and the threading pass and the threading pass. Um, I do a threading pass and then I go back and I turn it again and then I do a spring pass with the threading. And I think what happened was the starting position of the regular threading pass and of the spring threading pass were in different positions and the threading doesn't like that. So I recoded it and I basically did a total air cut as the very first, like when I'm doing the spring pass, I pretend it's the main pass except I just delete all the middle passes. So anyway, that worked great. It looks, I was watching it, it looked like it cut different. So we'll see the next part that comes out. I'll show you guys the difference between the bad threads that I was having before and the perfect threads I'm having now. Now they're not deep enough, they're definitely too big, but that's easy to fix. The thread quality looks really good. All right, so check this out. The one on the left is the newest one. The one on the right is the old one. You can see the kind of double thread, hashy grossness that I have on the inside. I don't like that. Also, on the one on the left, you can see the Higby thread, 
You know what's funny is I do actually have a mount that somebody made for me that slides on here and the phone clips into it. I just, I haven't even unboxed it yet. I've looked at it, but I haven't applied it to the thing yet. I need to do that. It's stupid. Just, there's always so much going on. Okay, there we go. I can point. Um, so you can see my Higby thread is quite a bit to the left of where it needs to be. I want that uh, ridge to be at the thread. So I just got to move it over five thou, ten thou or something. Easy point. Easy peasy. Also, if somebody was, uh, somebody sent me a message and corrected me that Higby thread, what did he say? A Higby thread has to be dimensionally perfect to do something something, um, but a blunt start thread is basically what I'm doing, which is just cutting the burr down. So I just like the word Higby better. It sounds cooler. <laughs> but maybe it is technically called a blunt start thread, which I like that too, it works cool. Also kind of interesting, I don't know if you can tell the color difference between the two. This one is a little bit darker because it's a couple days old. So it's actually oxidized just in the air of the shop and changed a bit darker color. This one's the one we just cut. It's brighter and shinier. It's kind of cool. This whole bin is that darker color. The very last thing that I've been working on is a little tiny burr that's right on this edge, which is right here, this guy. I didn't like it and I knew I could fix it. So it didn't take that long. I ended up having to draw this shape right here, having a few degrees uh, before the actual edge. And then I'm using a 2D wrap contour toolpath to basically go like that. The tool's already here deburring the hole. Uh, it doesn't take too much longer to do that. And it turns out awesome. That's basically what it looks like. And on the part, you almost can't even see it. But it's there. I think you can see it. Right there. Oh yeah, oh, I love that so much. That is the kind of detail that I like. So good, so good. Uh, in case you're wondering what this dimple is, it's just when the lollipop tool is going in here, it, it hits that. So I don't care. It is what it is. But now it's got a dimple and a chamfer. Okie dokie. Now my art is complete. Time to move to stainless and make this thing for reals. I've been uh, looking forward to this for quite a long time. Kind of sick of tweaking. Time to get it done. Mm, time lapse. I figured this was a perfect opportunity to show you guys real quick how the bar feeder works. So you can see the brass rod right there. I've pulled it all the way back. Which I think, jeez, was not expecting that noise. Yeah, I can move it forward and back using the buttons on the control panel. So I've moved it all the way back. This is a pincher. Oh, look at the warning. It pinches down on the bar, it squishes it in place, and then this collet uh, goes backwards and sucks itself off of the bar. So I'm gonna click the open button. And it's gonna go to there, hit the pincher. It's pulling, it's pulling, it's pulling, it's trying to go, it's trying to go. Aha, there it goes. And then the guide channel opens and now there's a place for the bar to go. Um, uh, I lost the part counter, but the bar was obviously short enough to fall into the remnant drawer. This is where all of the end of bars go. Notice how the brass one's a bit longer than the other ones. You can't see anymore, um, but it was fall short enough to fall into the thing. So right around nine inches or so is the last little bit you cannot use on a Swiss lathe. They're all probably different, but let's go get some stainless. I've placed the bars on these 
rolly things right on the very end there right on the last one make sure this one's the same it's hard doing this with one hand I was just noticing I've got the bars lined up on this side, but one is quite a bit shorter than the other one because I've obviously used it a little bit. I've been playing with it. Um, that's fine. The, the bar feeder automatically measures. It's got this little guy, this little flapper right here that, one, that lowers and then the bar pushes up against it and then the thing knows exactly how long the bar is. It's pretty sweet. And then, like I was showing in the other video, you tell it your part length, 880, and it knows how many parts are within your thing with a, uh, um, yeah, the remnant size is in there somewhere. Just remembered, as I said in one of the other videos, um, now that I'm moving to stainless, I gotta adjust the guide bushing for the different diameter bar, and, uh, Maybe I'll be a good boy and measure these two and make sure that they're exactly the same. Batch to batch, let's do that. Three, seven, four, seven, five. So we have half a tenth difference, half a tenth, yeah, between the two bars, basically identical. Um, perfect. Quick disclaimer, do not try this at home. On this thing, I have temporarily disabled the safety lock so that we can film inside and see what's going on. Uh, there's a bit of splashing and certainly some pinch points, so I'm not gonna have my fingers anywhere close. I am aware of the risks. Don't do this at home or at work, because that's where I am. So, disclaimer aside, I'm not being stupid. I just, all the other machines have interlocks. We, you know, we play by the rules. Anyway, I wanna show you guys, because it's kind of cool. Before I got a bar feeder, bar feeder, not a barf eater like some people here. Um, before I got one of these, I had no idea how they worked and it's kind of hard to get it from a lot of the videos that are out there. So let me try to show you guys real quick. Okay, so I've mounted my two bars. I can add more later, it's no big deal. I can add it while it's running, um, just not while it's moving. D -d -d okay, so I've added the two bars. I have to click the forward load button. By the way, this is a an LNS GT112E. So click the forward load button and you'll watch the one bar, the screws will rotate. One bar drops in, second bar is in position now. So the bar is in there to about there. There's a pusher flag at the back that's gonna click the bar forward. There's two ways to operate this control panel. One's manual, which I'm gonna do right now. The other is automatic where the machine kind of tells it what to do. I'm gonna go the manual way, so I'm gonna click the close button, clampy close. It's gonna move the bar forward. There we go, pusher's moving. Clamp, spray. I think, where'd the spray go? Um, the collet has now pushed itself onto the end of the bar right there and now we're ready to go so now i can click the forward button and you can see the measurement like that so you go forward enough and it's going to end up in here open the door i love how the lights turn on right when you open the door it's like let there be light so there's a supported bushing or whatever you call it tube right back there so the bar goes in there and doesn't flop around too much. Um, and then once I push the bar forward enough, you'll see it pop out of the collet here. So yeah, and then it's just, I gotta adjust that. I gotta adjust the guide bushing and then I'm ready to rock. Turning Mike around.
Come on. Okay. I learned something a couple weeks ago when I was adjusting the main spindle collet. This is what grips the bar firmly and lets it push forward. When you have a drill bit on the other side and the bar is pushed and you're pushing it, you're pushing the material into the drill bit, um, I had not adjusted the clampingness of the main bushing, the main collet, so it was loose and the drill bit was actually pushing the bar back, pushing the material back in the main collet. And it was like, I was drilling holes only halfway deep and like variable depths and it was driving me crazy. And then I uh, texted a buddy of mine and like right at the same time as he answered, I kind of figured it out, I think. Um, but it was like not tight enough. So super critical that we tighten that. All right. So now that the Guide bushing is adjusted, all the collets are adjusted, the bar's sticking out that far. I get to manually decide. I've got it on hand wheel, I've got the collet closed. Cut that again. Got it on hand wheel, I've got the collet closed, the light is off. Uh, Z1, Z1. See, I'm Canadian, but I lived in America for a long time, so I say Z and Z both, so don't make fun of me. Um, and then, jog wheel because I'm on Z1. Notice the Z value is moving. If we look in here, that whole carriage is moving. And the bar is moving in and out. So I'm adjusting it to until that cart, cart off blade. So I move to X1 and I'm gonna slowly and pay attention, bring this part off blade down. If I'm stupid or not looking, it will crunch. Uh, all I really wanna do is see how far to stick it out. So that's not gonna work, but I want that blade to cut the nub right off. So that's good. Now I'm set for stainless. If I were doing that um, without filming, just with pure focus and everything, I could probably bang that whole thing out in like three minutes, four minutes. Um, with filming, it took like 15, 20. But, uh, but yeah, okay, ready to go. Yeah, that's everything. One more thing. Had some really great comment. Like, all the comments in these videos are awesome. I am reading through them. Um, they're really fun. Some great comments are have checklists for stuff like this. So I do have post-it notes that I keep close by. Um, so a lot of times before I set up a job, I'll be like, okay, what do I gotta do? I gotta do this and then this and then this and then this, you know, call it guide bushing, call it blah, 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 tighten this, tension that. I'll write it all down because it's really nice to be able to prep and think about it all ahead of time and then just check it off. Um, it's a bit harder while filming. Not really, I just haven't thought about it. So yeah, it's a great idea. I just remembered the last thing that I haven't measured on this is the hole size of those three balls. It's a reamed hole, so I'm sure it's perfect. Wow. Let's find out. I got my small gauge pin set. And we've been using the big one before. Um, so it's supposed to be 65. We actually put a tag on it last time so that we just remember. It's easier to find. It does go through, but it's really, really tight. I wonder if that's because of the deburring inside. It's actually shoving a little tiny burr inside. Um, so 64 will fit like a glove very loosely. 65 is like barely, like probably too tight. Um, that's an official term, it's probably too tight. But I'm happy with that, that's good. If I really needed that extra little bit, I would drill it, ream it, deburr it, and then ream it again. I don't know if you're supposed to do that but that would totally work because it would kick all the burrs out of the way. Any, any last little ones. Yeah. All right, so now you guys have been spoiled with brass up until now. I'm gonna show you what a crap show it is with oil. You can't see nothing. Um, I mean, once you get your eye used to it, you can sort of see what's going on, but for the most part, you, you can't. And some materials, especially titanium, you just do not turn dry. Especially with oil, because oil be flammable. Ugh. There's actually a fire suppression system on this lathe. I don't know if I've shown that. Um, 
there's like a red hose that goes around that melts at a certain temperature and then fire suppression nozzles that psh, scary scary stuff but uh if we're smart we'll always be fine mostly i haven't had a problem yet i have seen a flame when i was trying to cut titanium dry like an idiot but uh it extinguished itself really quick so let's do this Okay, whoo, whoo, whoo. Mental checklist. Yeah, it's fine. I turned the coolant back on. There's a quick button, block delete. I turned it off before. Uh, it's still got a brass part on the sub side, but that's fine. All right. Here we go. Goggle up. That's the low-pressure coolant. See what I mean? Kind of hard to see anything. I will say though, the new Aero X is killing it. Let's reset, open the door. Look at that, not even smoky inside. So already dripping like crazy. So you stick your hands inside, you get all oily. Um, okay, so we have a stainless part right over there. Awesome. Um, man, a lot of new variables just happened right now. I noticed that this holder right there is also plumbed up to the part off blade. So when that gets through coolant, then this guy just blasts coolant out. So I got to plug that up or unplug the line. It's probably what I'm going to do. I think it's that one right there. So I'm going to unplug it and cap that off. Give me more pressure to the part off blade. Very important. Um, I think that's the only thing I noticed. Yeah, the pucker factor increases with more variables. I can't find anything to focus on. Oh, I heard it. Here we go. Of course, now is when the oiliness starts to happen. This thing is dripping with oil. Looks good so far. Looks like a thing. I bet you the threads are way too tight as well. They're almost too tight. They're better than I expected because brass cuts so much easier. I expected the stainless, this thing's like 45 Rockwell, really hard. It's tighter, but it's not as tight as I expected. So, quick little offset. I'm guessing here, but through experience, I kind of know how much to drop it by. Um, okay, I need a deeper thread. Yeah, and then I just go through each tolerance and I measure and I measure and, you know, I'll check the holes again and then comp the machine to make perfect parts. And, oh my gosh, I just realized, like, once I dial in the actual dimensions, we're good. We're in production. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Finally. Finally. <laughs> All right, let's get this dialed in. Perfect. One tenth too big on diameter. I'm gonna comp that. This machine has five digits behind the zero. All the other machines only have four. Well, not the current, that doesn't count. My mill and my other lathe, uh, 
only have four digits. This thing's got five. That's a lot. Okay, check my part length. Mostly happy with that. Might tweak it. Okay. Quick little interesting tidbit. My first stainless part, I'm trying the 065 pin again. It fits in very easily. It did not fit in the brass. So I wonder if the deburring on this is actually working, whereas the brass, it worked, but it might've pushed some stuff in. So I'm gonna check this thing out of the microscope right now and uh, take a closer look. You can spy me from across the shop. guys I think that about does it for this video uh, the parts are going great right now so good why is my exposure so whited out I don't know how to change that anyway um, parts going awesome I made like 10 15 plus already it's going excellent um, I was just texting Angelo right now and realized that he's like oh did you test fit them and make sure that they fit good in, in the mechanism in the pen and I was like uh, no, that's the one thing I forgot to do. I haven't test fit the steel ones to make sure that the offset that I did, the three thou offset, actually works. Uh, I'm sure it's super duper close, so I'm gonna test that. And yeah, anyway guys, take care, see you soon. So I was wrong, I totally have a little bit more to show you guys. So I've got my bench vise here, and I mounted, I don't know if you can see, mounted my Saga in the vise. And I've got an indicator here on a Noga, Noga base. And... Uh, how do I hold this? So that is awesome. That's the newest one. I tweaked it a little bit. I tweaked it and uh, the original one, like the one I've been carrying for a long time has eight thou of movement and you really feel that. One thou, I can, I can feel it because I know it's there. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you can't feel it. Eight thou, you can feel like, like I showed you in the beginning. Um, and then I made another one and I tweaked it a little bit and it was, uh, three and a half thou and then I got to this one and I bumped it a little bit more and I got it down to one thou and one thou is perfect now like I said before we have to leave a little bit of room for tolerances and growth and stack up in different parts got a bunch of different components here they each have their own tolerance range I think this will be perfect so that makes me happy let's be finished strong let's me make a bunch of parts know they're gonna be good and uh, I'm actually gonna leave this thing running tonight and go home put maybe two or three bars in there. Not too many, but enough to like make a bunch of parts. And uh, yeah, go home. It's 9.30 at night. I need to go home. So yeah, that's it.